So we're going to finish up with our nomenclature unit of study here uh, and uh, then move into uh, a new unit of study. Where we were previously, we had been dealing with uh, exclusively ionic nomenclature, nomenclature of ionic compounds, and uh, we had started with the ionic nomenclature using type 1 metals, which are those that uh, allow for only one type of cation to be formed. And then we got into the same sort of thing, but uh, with uh, using type 2 metals, and we were introduced to a number of uh, new metals and their, uh, and their different oxidation states, their different cationic charges. And the last thing we looked at were, uh, were polyatomic ions as a substitute for the nonmetal in, uh, in, in a nomenclature. Um, and uh, that, that finished us off. All of these were for uh, ionic nomenclature, but we have yet to look at uh, covalent nomenclature, covalent molecules, which we'll start into now. So now we're going to be looking at the nomenclature of molecular compounds. When I say molecular, I mean covalent compounds, always between two nonmetals. Um, there's still going to be binary compounds, meaning there's only two components in there. In, a, in an ionic binary compound, that meant a cation and an anion. In this case, it just means two different nonmetals, not three or four. So binary compounds simplifies things. Now, when we were looking at ionic compounds, um, uh, it did not matter. We did not designate in the, in, in, in the nomenclature or the name of a compound uh, how many copies, if you will, of the metal and the nonmetal there were in the uh, chemical formula. That was implied by the fact that the, all the positive charge, the breadth of the positive charge has to exactly uh, cancel out the breadth of the negative charge. This is a big difference when we're talking about covalent compounds and the nomenclature of covalent compounds. We do use uh, these Greek prefixes to denote the numbers of each element. Since we're working with two nonmetals, we have to distinguish which, which nonmetal is placed first in the name and which is placed second. And by convention, it's always the less electronegative element uh, placed first and the more electronegative element placed second. Both are nonmetals, but that's the, the, the convention we use. Notice in each case, we're using a prefix, a prefix on, uh, on in, in both cases. And that prefix essentially means how many of each. We didn't see this in uh, ionic nomenclature, but we do see it. Indeed, we have to see it in, uh, in covalent nomenclature. So what is a prefix? Well, we'll be using uh, what are called Greek prefixes to denote numbers, and we'll go up to four. So we'll so see mono means one, two is di, three is tri. Those are, are pretty straightforward. Four is a little off the beaten path, tetra. So tetra is four. So we'll, it's just something we'll have to keep in mind. Um, but let's look at some examples uh, where we bring in these uh, Greek uh, prefixes, and we'll look at some limitations and special exceptions. So just as in ionic nomenclature, this is a two-way street, this uh, nomenclature of uh, covalent compounds. Now I can either give a chemical formula, as we see here, and ask for a name, or give a name and ask for the chemical formula. In both cases, I find it's more straightforward than, the, than what we were doing with the ionic nomenclature, but you can be uh, the, the judge of that. Let's, let's take a look. So here we have CCl4. We see that carbon, that's the first C, is a nonmetal, and Cl, chlorine, is also a nonmetal. So we're going to say we're going to name this as a covalent compound. That may seem trivial, but we have to discern at first is this a covalent compound or is this an ionic compound because they're named differently. We have somewhat different rules. So in this case, we have to use our Greek multipliers, but there's a twist here. Uh, the name of this compound would be carbon tetrachloride. Tetra is four, and there's four chlorines. Now, in uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 not drawbacks, but, but uh, essential uh, ideas here is that if there is only one of the first element in uh, covalent nomenclature, the mono prefix is not used. In this case, this is not monocarbon tetrachloride, it's just carbon tetrachloride because the first one, if it's one, we don't, uh, we don't consider that. 
So now let's look at one where we have a name and we want to give a uh, you get the chemical formula. Here we have sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur, that means there's one sulfur. Hex, well, that's the one we did that goes beyond tetra. But hexa, if we think like hexagon, that's a six-sided uh, six, uh, 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 type of... Uh, type of figure, so this would be six fluorides. So this would be SF6. This is fairly, I, th I think, more straightforward than ionic because there's more uh, information there. The next one, we see CO, carbon and oxygen. The first C, there's one of them, so we're not gonna call it, we're, that's not gonna be a mono. In this case, this is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. So here's where we encounter a contraction. If oxide is used with either mono or tetra, the, its pronunciation is contracted. Notice, carbon monoxide is not carbon monoxide, which would look like carbon monoxide if you, if you, uh, if you spelled it out. Uh, one of those O's is, uh, is, brought, uh, is, is, is contracted, if you will. So it's not carbon monoxide or carbon monoxide, but rather carbon monoxide. Down on the bottom here, uh, we, we see that, uh, again, dinitrogen tetroxide. That's oxide in there, and we were using tetra with it. It's not tetraoxide, it's just tetroxide. We get that, uh, we get that contraction. So in this case, we see di, that's two nitrogens, tetra, that's four oxygens, and indeed, N2O4 is how we would name this. The last thing we're going to be looking at in this unit of study are uh, certain acids, an acid nomenclature. Now, uh, if we looked at a, a general textbook of general chemistry, we would find that uh, there's a lot to naming acids, and a lot of it is very, very mundane. Uh, to some, it's important, but for us, and at this level of play, we're not going to be going into the detail uh, we need for the naming of acids. We're going to keep it practical. So uh, what I call this is the names and formulas of the six, what I call, ic acids. Ic, I-C. That means there's I-C in uh, each of the names. So, for instance, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, sulfur ic acid and so on. So that's why I term these ic acids. And really, this is just a, a very contracted version of what is normally a much more uh, involved process for naming acids. And I have six of them here. And it's only because we'll be using them a lot uh, within uh, the uh, lecture portion right here in the course, but also so a lot of these we'll be using in the lab portion. HNO3, nitric acid. HCl, hydrochloric acid. HBr, hydrobromic acid, and HI, hydroiodic acid, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, and H3PO4, phosphoric acid. So that finished us off with Unit 6, um, and we're going to move into Unit 7 now. And doing this uh, is going to take a... Uh, uh, a bit of a turn here. We're going to get back uh, pretty heavily into calculation, uh, into dimensional analysis again. The, the title of this chapter is called Chemical Composition, and uh, ultimately what we're going to be looking at now are amounts, amounts of uh, a, uh, an element or a compound or a sample of matter, and be able to convert between those different amounts. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll look in, for instance, we're going to introduce the concept of the mole and how we get from grams of a, of, of a uh, particular uh, sample of matter to moles of that matter, and even <clears throat> to the number of particles of that, uh, of that matter. So let's start off with, uh, with uh, some, some, some generalities here uh, before we get into uh, the main event, if you will. So the next topic I want to get into is an offshoot of something we were looking at in a previous unit of study when we were talking about uh, elements and atoms and that sort of thing, the idea of atomic mass, that number which is uh, right below every uh, chemical symbol in the periodic table, and that was, we defined that in atomic mass units. You know, for instance, carbon is uh, uh, one atom of carbon 
weighs, uh, or weighs uh, 12.01 atomic mass units. But now that we're talking about uh, compounds, uh, we're, we're, we're going to expand that, that idea to what is called the formula mass. The formula mass is essentially just the sum of the atomic masses of atoms that make up a molecule or uh, of, a, of a covalent compound or a formula unit of uh, an ionic compound. And let's look at an example here. Um, here we have uh, carbon dioxide. What would be the formula mass of carbon dioxide? Well, we see carbon dioxide has one carbon and two oxygen atoms in it. Well, uh, that would mean that we're going to add up the uh, atomic masses of one carbon and two oxygens to a simple, simple addition here. And what we would end up with is the formula mass of now this compound, carbon dioxide. Now we can come up with uh, formula masses for uh, for, for, for any number of covalent or ionic compounds. On top here is an example of a representative covalent compound, glucose. I know it's a covalent compound because it's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, all non-metals. And what, all I'm doing is, so here we have C6. Well, I'm taking six times the atomic mass of carbon, H12, plus 12 times the atomic mass of hydrogen, O6, which is adding in six times the atomic mass of oxygen. It's really that simple to get a formula mass of 180.18 atomic mass units. This also works very well for ionic compounds. Here's a, aluminum chloride. Um, in, in this case, we have uh, a, aluminum, uh, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a nonmetal. We have one aluminum, so that's one times the atomic mass of aluminum and three chlorines which is three times the atomic mass of chlorine to give 133.33 atomic mass units. All of these are handled in exactly the same fashion. It's very straightforward. And believe me, uh, as we get into calculations here, you'll have to be doing these uh, on your calculator um, on the fly because we're going to be needing uh, uh, these uh, uh, formula masses uh, many times in, in some of the problems we'll be doing. So now we're going to be getting into a very somewhat familiar concept for many of us, and it's really the bane of many of our existences, and uh, as, as chemistry goes, the idea or the concept of the mole. Now, uh, the mole is really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a crutch, it's a helping hand, because individual atoms or molecules are too small to weigh and handle, obviously. We can't take uh, a molecule or an atom and weigh it on an analytical balance, so it does not translate well when discussing the concept of the molecule or an atom into the laboratory. But we, what ultimately we're trying to do with a mole, all a mole is is a number. That is it. It's a very, very, very large number, but it's just a very large number. And the size of this packet, or number if you will, is as follows, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, we, as far as a mole goes, as I said, it's just a number. We could be talking about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd dinner forks, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, beach balls, whatever, I don't know. But when we're talking about uh, particles, and I put here atoms, like atoms of an element, I could be talking about uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of a compound, like carbon dioxide, or so on and so forth. It's just the number of particles. This is known as Avogadro's number. Here's a picture of Amadeo Avogadro. He's the uh, scientist, mathematician that, uh, that, that derived all this. We won't be deriving uh, mathematically Avogadro's number or anything like that. We're just going to be using it in a practical sense, because in a practical sense, it takes some, something that is immeasurably small, for instance, like an atom, we cannot weigh an atom on, a, on an analytical balance. We can't weigh 10 atoms on an analytical balance or a million atoms on an analytical balance. But if we took 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of any element, that would register on an analytical balance within a reasonable range. This is why we do it because it connects, as I was saying before, uh, the immeasurable number of atoms, a few, uh, or an, an atom, with the measure, the imminently measurable on an analytical balance, the, the mass we get on an analytical balance. So it connects with grams, something very, very practical.
So we can make the statement that says one mole of an elements or compounds particles weighs its molar mass in grams. So molar mass is the same thing as atomic mass for, uh, for an element. Uh, it's just that we have a mole of those atoms. It's the same thing as the formula mass for a compound, except that we have a mole of those particles or molecules. So that's what I mean by molar mass. We'll be talking about that uh, in, in, a, in a little a bit more, but there's the connection. If I have one mole of, uh, of, of neon atoms, well, that's going to weigh, I know exactly what it's going to weigh, 20.183 grams. How do I know that? Because that's the atomic mass on the periodic table under neon. So uh, we can now convert this to grams. Works the same way with, uh, with, with molecules or, or uh, compounds, whether we have an ionic compound or a covalent compound. This was that carbon dioxide. This is something we actually did when we talked about formula mass. Remember, uh, we came up with that 44.01 or so, uh, where, uh, where atomic mass units were, is what one molecule of carbon dioxide would weigh, but if we had 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, or one mole of carbon dioxide molecules, well, that's how much it weighs now in grams. Eminently more practical, eminently more measurable. And it's actually the, the concept of the mole, known as Avogadro's number, as we saw here, is in itself, and we're going to be using it as such, a per expression. Remember, per expression, back in the first couple of units, it is a per expression, which can be written as such. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of a substance, could be atoms of an element, molecules of a compound, so on, per one mole of that substance. And that's it. That's really it. So all we're doing is we're talking about a very, very large number of these particles and making them much more... Uh, much and expressing them in a much more straightforward way. So as I was saying on the last slide, this is very practical. It's more straightforward. Why is that? Well, look, here is just a sort of a gee whiz type of slide saying, all right, I have a number of, uh, of, of elements here. You know, calcium, I have nickel, zinc, and so on. And each of them represent exactly one mole of atoms one mole. So we can see a mole of zinc, and this is what it would look like. Look at this. I could weigh this on an analytical balance. A mole of nickel looks like that. That's very weighable on an analytical balance. We bring it directly into the laboratory. It's, very, it's a very practical number. Now, obviously, uh, this uh, zinc right here or this nickel right here is not exactly 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms of each element, but it's pretty close, close enough. Somebody, uh, for instance, uh, weighing out this, uh, this zinc right here, uh, basically looked for the uh, atomic mass of zinc on the periodic table and weighed out as close as, as they could that mass of zinc. And we can have a reasonably uh, close uh, uh, approximation that, well, that is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms of zinc. And here we have a number of, uh, of other examples. And it's just, you know, it's just sort of random elements here. But that's what it means. Now we can see these. Now we can weigh these. The mole is a very practical type of idea. So we had said that Avogadro's number was a good per expression. So we can convert, it's a doorway between the number of particles and the number of moles within a substance. We'll be doing examples that show exactly that. But there is another uh, more important per expression that we're gonna be looking at uh, we're, because we're gonna be doing this consistently. And that is a doorway between the number of grams of a substance and the number of moles of a substance. So let's look what we have here. Since one mole of the particles of a substance weighs its molar mass, or atomic mass if it's an element, or formula mass if it's a compound, we're calling it molar mass now because we're going to be looking at it with respect to or assuming one mole of a compound. Um, if, so since one mole of the particles of a substance weighs its molar mass in grams, the units of measure for molar mass are grams per mole. That's a per expression. Now, 
uh, when we write that uh, sort of uh, in language, uh, the la language or phonetically is given as g or grams per mole, grams per mole. But really what we're looking at is uh, a way of looking at that down here. So we could put this into a per expression uh, if, and put this into a, an equation as a per expression. No longer, and we just learned this, but no longer um, are we going to be bound by units of atomic mass units, which are incredibly, uh, incredibly unhelpful and unpractical. Um, they're not practical as a lab, of, uh, uh, as a unit of measure for everyday lab work. But what is very practical for lab work are grams. So here now, on the bottom, we have a doorway between grams, that's a, that's a measured number in the laboratory, and moles, which is an immeasurable number. We cannot measure moles directly. We can only measure grams directly, but we can infer the number of moles. We can calculate the number of moles of a substance by weighing out its mass in grams. So let's take a look at some examples of how we would do this. And yes, we're going right back to uh, dimensional analysis, just like we looked at before in, uh, in the first and some of the second uh, uh, units of study. So there are many types of questions that we can ask with these uh, two new per expressions that we'll be using over and over. Um, and we're gonna go through a, a number of different iterations to, uh, to, to, to show that. Um, the heading here is converting between moles of a sample and the number of particles in it. So if I said something like these two representative questions, like I have uh, this many uh, particles, how many moles is that? Or I have this many moles of this substance, how many particles is that? And when I say particles, again, I'm talking about atoms of an element or, um, or molecules of a compound and so on. But let's look at the top here. How many helium atoms are in 3.5 moles of helium? So really what we're doing is we're uh, connecting the number of particles with the number of moles. Well, that is a ready-made for Avogadro's number put into the form of a per expression, and I put it up right there, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles per one mole of substance. So in this case, we go back to, we are definitely using uh, our, how to solve these word problems, that dimensional analysis again. That's the way we solve word problems, using those three age-old questions that, uh, uh, that, that, that we learned or that I showed you in, back in the first unit of study. What do we have? What do we want? And how are we going to get there? So in all, and that can all be derived, or most of it can be derived from the question, what do we have? Well, in this case, is that the pure number Within, uh, within that question, 3.5 moles of helium. What do we want? What is the question asking? How many helium atoms equals some number of helium atoms? And how are we gonna get there? Well, we we're multiplying through using Avogadro's uh, number in this case, and we just put it right in there. And we see here, since uh, we, we can, we're going to be canceling out of moles of helium, and we're going to be into number of atoms, in this case, or number of particles. So uh, since, uh, since uh, these two units uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, even up, now we reach for our calculator, we do, the, we do the calculation, and we end up with 2.1 times 10 to the 24th helium atoms. It's all about canceling out here and going into the units of measure that you want. Let's look at the next one. 1.71 times 10 to the 24th carbon atoms are how many moles of carbon? Well, in this case, we're gonna use Avogadro's number again, but uh, if we uh, set this up into, well, what do we have? <clears throat> this number of atoms, what do we want? Well, what's it asking? How many moles of carbon? Some number of moles of carbon. Yes, we are going to use Avogadro's number, but we have to use its reciprocal. Um, and as we said before, Per expressions are very sturdy chaps. They can be used uh, uh, in, in either reciprocal form. So we're gonna place this in, uh, at, in this case, uh, at the, the opposite of what we looked at before in the previous question, so that we're able to cancel out the number of atoms and end up with moles. That is indeed what we want. And then and only then do we reach for our calculator and calculate through and it comes out to 2.84 moles of carbon.
Okay, let's look at another heading here. Converting between grams of a sample and a number of moles. So now we're looking at something different. It's not Avogadro's number. We only use Avogadro's number in a per expression when we're talking about a sheer number of particles. Here we're just talking about grams. That's not particles, that's grams. Converting to moles, asking between grams and moles. Those are both uh, quantities. They're not the number of particles. So we're not gonna use Avogadro's number. Let's look at this first one. How many moles of sulfur is 57.8 grams of sulfur? Well, uh, what's the doorway between grams and moles? It is that molar mass of the substance in question, in this case, sulfur. So we'd have to use the molar mass of sulfur achievable just by looking at the periodic table and finding that atomic mass. Um, and we're gonna be using that, or putting that into the form of a per expression, as we see here, uh, to solve the problem. What do we have? What's my number? 57.8 grams of sulfur. What do we want? What is the question asking? How many moles of sulfur are we going to end up? And how are we going to get there? Well, there, we're going to use the, we have to be a sleuth here. The doorway between grams and moles is the molar mass of the substance in question. And we have to, in this case, invert it, or rather take its reciprocal, so that we can uh, cancel out of grams of sulfur and end up with moles of sulfur. That is indeed what we want, so that is all she wrote, and we uh, hammer this through our calculator to come up with 1.80 moles of sulfur. The next one, 7.35 moles of FeCl2 is how many grams of the same? Well, in addition to this being a reverse type of question as the previous one, <clears throat> we're also dealing with a compound now, not an element. So that we have to uh, use the molar mass of, of, iron, of FeCl2 in the form of a per expression. So to do that, we take one times the atomic mass of iron plus two times the atomic mass of chlorine, which is what we did back when we were looking at formula mass. We can do that with anything. The numbers and types of... Uh, atoms or elements are right there. So we're going we're gonna to ultimately do that. And we, again, <clears throat> we're looking to go between uh, moles and grams. That doorway between moles and grams or grams and moles is really all the same. Uh, and we're going to use the molar mass for that. So let's uh, start our three age-old questions. What do we have? Well, that's a number in there, 7.35 moles of FeCl2. What do we want? how many grams of the same equals that. How are we going to get there? Well, we have to add up the uh, separate atomic masses for each of these to come up with that molar mass, and that's the number that it is, 126.75 grams of FeCl2 per one mole. And here we carefully set this up, in this case it's correct, so we can cancel out and end up with our answer, 932 grams of FeCl2. All right, let's ramp it up a little bit. Look up here. Converting between grams of a sample of a substance and its number of particles. Well, we should recognize that we're not going to find a per expression that goes between grams and number of particles. Avogadro's number allows us to go from number of particles to moles. And molar mass allows us to go from moles to particles. So we're going to have to start daisy chaining together some of these, uh, some, some of these uh, uh, per expressions. So the first thing to do is we have to calculate the molar mass of NO2 because that's what we're dealing with. Um, and uh, in this case, NO2, uh, we're, we see it's actually worked out. We didn't in the last question. I didn't work it out for you, but I've worked it out for you here. Um, you know, one times the atomic mass of nitrogen and two times the atomic mass of oxygen. Add that up and we get our, uh, our, our molar mass of NO2. And we're going to be using that uh, as a per expression. Also, Avogadro's number we're going to have to be using here as stated before. So let's start putting this together into a dimensional analysis. What do we have? Where is my number? There it is. 4.78 times 10 to the 24th. NO2 molecules. What do we want? What's the question asking? What is the mass in grams? Well, we don't know that, but we'll put it over on the end there. And how are we gonna get there? Well, as we said before, we're gonna have to use both of these uh, uh, per expressions in order to get 
what we want. So first, to get out of the number of particles, which we, we appear to be in here, we're going to multiply by Avogadro's number, canceling out of particles, molecules NO2, um, and end up in moles. That's not grams. We're not in grams yet, but that's where we want to get to. But I know how to get from moles to grams using the molar mass that we just calculated of NO2 times 46.01 grams of NO2 per one mole of NO2. This cancels very nicely with that. And now we're in grams of NO2, both of them. Then and only then do we reach for our calculator and we end up with 365 grams of, uh, of NO2. So this was a process in this case. Let's see uh, how we do on the next one. How many aluminum atoms? are in an aluminum cup with a mass of 16.2 grams. That would probably be a pretty small cup, but no, no, no bother. We're going to uh, move through this. Uh, in this case, again, both Avogadro's number and the atomic mass of aluminum, the element, because that's what we're dealing with, are used as per expressions here. What do we have? Well, there's the number, 16.2 grams of aluminum. What do we want? How many aluminum atoms is this? Put that at the other end. How are we going to get there? Well, starting from grams, we're going to have to get to our intermediate moles by using the molar mass, or rather the atomic mass, of aluminum. And there it is. Grams of aluminum cancels. We're left with moles. To get from moles to number of particles, we use Avogadro's number. So there's, uh, in this case, moles of aluminum cancels with moles of aluminum. And we are indeed uh, complete here because we have atoms of aluminum the same on both sides. And we end up with 3.62 times 10 to the 23rd aluminum atoms. All of these uh, you know, types of questions or subtypes we see on each page are handled the same way. And uh, working through the, the problems that I have on on Blackboard for this, will uh, you do a few of these, and very quickly you you get into sort of a, a routine of it, being able to solve these. Sometimes we run into problems which can seem de deceptively difficult, but they're not really difficult. Let's look up top here. Converting between moles of a compound and moles of one of its constituent elements within that compound. An example here is. How many moles of oxygen atoms are in 1.70 moles of calcium carbonate, CaCO3? Well, to do this, we have to take a formula unit of calcium carbonate and break it apart and see what we have. If I have one molecule or one formula unit of calcium carbonate uh, right up here, if I break that up like a Lego block tower, I'm going to end up with one atom, or rather, uh, uh, or, uh, ion of, of calcium, one atom of carbon, and look at this, since that subscript three is there, I end up with three atoms of oxygen. What I have here is a one to three, or rather three to one per expression, hiding in plain sight. There's three moles of oxygen atoms per one mole of calcium carbonate. Uh, because we were able to deconstruct this calcium, one calcium carbonate here down into and to show its relationship with the number of oxygen atoms it produces once we deconstruct it, that's three to one. Ha uh, armed with that knowledge, we can use this in a per expression. So what, what do we have? 1.70 moles of calcium carbonate. Again, down on the bottom, what do we want? Moles of oxygen. There it is. How are we going to get there? Guess what? I'll bet we will use this thing in some way, shape, or form, and indeed we do. That cancels out, us out of moles of calcium carbonate uh, and gives us moles of oxygen. And this really is just a matter of taking 1.7 and multiplying by 3. Um, so there's where I said this is seem, might seem initially deceptively difficult, but it's really not uh, in this case. So uh, it's important to recognize that sometimes it's not as hard as you might think. So let's take a look at uh, another question. And this one, uh, we have to do a little thinking about it. So if you look up top here, it says converting between grams of a compound and grams of one of its elements. So that's like me saying, um, all right, I have a sample of water here, sample of water, 
And I want to know, and it has a mass, has a heft to it. I want to know how much of that mass or that heft in my hand is attributable to just the hydrogen in water, which is H2O. Sort of a question nobody would ever ask or even care about, but bear with me here because this does, uh, thinking of it this way does allow us to bring in some uh, so, some uh, an important consideration which we'll be using later in the next lecture. But let's look at a question. Carvone, C10H14O, is an organic compound which is a component of spearmint oil. Find the mass of carbon in 55.4 grams of carvone. So if I have 55.4 grams of this, uh, of this carbon compound, I want to say, well, how much of this would be attributable just to carbon? something nobody would ask, but we're gonna answer it just cause. Um, so again, we have to think about this. The idea here um, is that we have a mole conversion, just like we looked at in the last uh, example between one molecule of carvone and the number of carbon atoms, I say carbons here, but the number of carbon atoms it contains. So for each one molecule of this, we have 10 carbon atoms. That's evident right from the chemical formula. So that is indeed a 1 to 10. That's a per expression hiding in plain sight. And we're going to be uh, uh, working with that as we move forward. So we're going to be looking at this from the standpoint of a dimensional analysis as before. Um, what do we have? Well, we have uh, that number there, 55.4 grams of carvone. What do we want? Well, let's find the mass of just carbon in there, way over here. Does that make you a little nervous that we're way over here, leaving a lot of real estate uh, in here to be filled up? Well, let's just see how it goes. So uh, uh, where we are now, we ask, what do we have? This mass of carbon. What do we want? How many grams of that is just attributable to, car to carbon? Well, how are we going to get there? All right. Well, I have grams of carbon here. Um, a good rule of thumb, if you have no idea where to start, uh, use the following uh, uh, advice, because it's right most of the time. When in doubt, convert to moles. If you're given, as a starting point, one, uh, a gram amount of, uh, of starting material, convert that to moles somehow convert it to moles because that's probably the way we're going to be doing that. Now to do that, uh, we have to take uh, how we moles of what? Well, moles of carbon here. That is 10 times the atomic mass of carbon we get from a periodic table, plus 14 times the atomic mass of hydrogen, plus one times the atomic mass of oxygen and add them all together on your calculator. And we're gonna come up with the number 150.2 grams of that. That number, 150.2, is adding up all of those individual atomic masses as we did before. And we've, we set this up in a uh, inverted or reciprocal version uh, of the, the usual way uh, a molar mass is, is expressed so that we can cancel out of grams of carbon very easily and end up with mole of carbon. Well, now we have moles of carbon, but we want to eventually get to just talking about carbon, not just carbon. So how can I do that? Well, we're going to find that in this case, we had a per expression hiding in plain sight. The mole conversion here, the mole conversion between one molecule of carbon and the number of carbons in it is one to 10. We saw that because there's 10 carbon atoms in one molecule of carbon. That, that's a 1 to 10 molar relationship. So that's a per expression in itself that we're going to put in there. And if we look at this carefully, that's 10 moles of carbon if we have one mole of carbon. So if I had one mole of carbon, I'd have 10 moles of car carbon within it. That is given to us right within the uh, the molecular formula. For every one of carbones, there's 10 uh, carbon atoms, if you will. So, and, and we know, so we, we've been moving through this grams of carbone. We canceled with grams of carbone. 
Now moles of carbon, we cancel moles of carbon, and we're left with moles of carbon. I want grams of carbon. What's my doorway between moles of carbon and grams of carbon? The atomic mass of carbon, gotten directly from the periodic table. And that's, in this case, grams per mole. So moles of carbon on the numerator, moles of carbon in a denominator cancels. We end up, we see grams of carbon on both sides. Then, and only then, do we reach for our calculator, and we're going to uh, then uh, come up with the number 44.3 grams of, uh, of carbon for every 55 point uh, four grams of carbon. Something, again, nobody would ask, but it brings up a good question, which we're going to uh, start by looking at in the next lecture.